So with coursework deadlines coming up on me, I had a, quite a lot of free times on my hands as I was doing everything possible not to do my actual coursework. I decided to start researching into weird planes of World War II, and I've compiled a list of five that I think are interesting weird planes that you guys will find rather interesting. But what I've made sure though is that these are all legit planes that actually did fly. There was a minimum of at least one prototype made, and that prototype did fly. So anyway, without further ado, and in no particular order, number five. The Blonnenvoss BV-141. Now this plane is a rather interesting, well, it's a, all of these planes are going to be interesting designs, but I find this one interesting because the reason they designed it like this is the philosophy to get a really good view for reconnaissance. And with this plane was designed to be a spotter plane. It was reconnaissance basically mostly, although it was designed to be able to fit light bombs under the wings. Although no versions that actually were flown during test flights actually carried any bombs for testing this theory but the designer said it could carry bombs if it needed to. But the main purpose of this was reconnaissance. There would be a three-man crew sitting in that little pod off to the side. It would be the pilot, the spotter, and a rear gunner. The design of the cockpit allows the spotter to have an excellent view of his surroundings, which is, you know, not the same for other bombers that were around at that time. Another advantage of having that rear pod to the side is that the rear gunner has a much more clearer line of sight behind the plane, except for the bit that is behind the tail. But other than that, he doesn't need to worry about shooting off the rudder or the elevators. So he might have a better time shooting things down, theoretically. They built around 20 of these, and they were tested. The main reason that I understand for them not going into mass production is that at the time, the engines they got for them were rather weak, and they were unimpressive. The kind of design philosophy for the Blonnenvoss, as well as being a scout aircraft, was the Germans had a kind of theory they were working for, which was we want this plane to be very fast. If our bombers are faster than the enemy fighters, then they don't need defensive armament. That's kind of the theory why they actually built the Arado, one of the, like, the first jet bombers. Uh, that's a story for another time. Unfortunately, there's no Blonnenvoss BV-141 on display anywhere. Even though there were 20 of them, and one of them was actually captured by the British, the rest have been destroyed. Number 4. The Vickers Wellington DW-1 Mark II. Well, and Mark 1 as well. These are pretty much the same things. There were two prototypes. But anyway, this plane was designed to be able to remotely detonate mines. Mostly naval mines. That's what they used it on. But it was theoretically supposed to be able to do landmines as well. But the idea of, the theory behind this was, is that by having a 50 diameter wide ring and running an electric current through it using a de onboard diesel engine to generate electricity, they could generate a magnetic field strong enough to remotely detonate mines. This is a fascinating concept, they used it mostly on a naval basis, by flying around between 35 foot to 60 foot above the water, in areas where they knew there most likely were mines, they could self-detonate them. Boats, they tried to mount this technology onto boats, but boats that were able to get this close enough to use it, suffered damage from the detonation of the mine, but with the Wellington, it was able to fly and fly out. There were a couple of bad detonations where the plane was a little below the safe altitude of 35 feet and suffered minor, minor damage, but the Wellington was a pretty rugged plane. It was able to take the shockwave. With all this extra weight on the Wellington though, it wasn't able to carry its usual bomb load, which it wouldn't need anyway, not because it's not doing a bombing mission, it's actually <laughs> it's doing a detonation mission. The sacrifice though of having this 50 foot ring around the plane and the extra diesel generator is that the Wellington had to strip out all its guns to save on the extra weight and also lose the extra crew members that were manning the gun stations. This plane did fly with fighter escorts, so though it never actually got intercepted by any German planes. Funnily enough, the Germans had also been working on their own remote mine detonation plane, which is basically the same concept that the British used on the Wellington, except they used it on the Junker. And this variant was the JU-52-3M-MS. Number 3. The YFM-1. This is an American plane, and it was designed for anti-bomber's role. And this, I don't know why I keep saying it, but every single plane, these are all very interesting designs. It's just except they all have little faults here and there. Now, this one has quite a few faults, but we'll get to that later. Now, the role of this plane was designed to be a bomber hunter. As you can see, in the two little pods to either side is a forward-facing gunner and controls a 37mm cannon. And for those of you who don't know, that's a very big shell going forwards. And being able to aim the 37mm cannon in two gun pods on either side allowed the pilot to focus on the flying aspect. Instead of trying to get guns on sides, he could focus on the flying, allow the gunners to do their job. Now, for the failures of this plane. Now, the reason this plane wasn't very successful is that it couldn't catch up the bombers. It just was just too heavy. It was a very heavy design, 
and the engines weren't too powerful either, which kind of makes the plane obsolete in the first place. If it can't catch up to enemy bombers to hunt them, then what is the point of this plane? There are also safety concerns. For example, you can see that the engines are behind the gunners. If the gunner needed to bail out an emergency, he kind of can't. He's going to get hit by the propellers. There are also a couple of major events that made this plane a big no-no for mass production. During a test flight, when the pilots put the plane into a deliberate spin, they were struggling to recover from the spin, which they should have been able to do due to the rudder locking into a certain position that it should not have. The pilots decided to switch off the engines and to bail out the plane. When the first pilot bailed out, during the bailout attempt, he hit himself on that rudder bit of the plane, freeing the rudder but badly hurting himself in the process. This co-pilot, which was still in the cockpit, attempted to try and take control back onto the plane now that the rudder was unjammed and was just about able to pull out of the dive and land it in the field safely, but it was still a very hard landing. Both pilots survived that situation. The other notable event was when an oil line broke inside mid-flight. The oil line caught fire and started a fire inside the plane. With the pilots with no way to put out the fire, they decided to bail out of the plane. During the bailout, the pilot was killed when he hit the rudder section and his parachute failed to open properly. Despite all of this though, there were still 13 made in total. And a few of them did fly for photo opportunities after, even after these events. Because it was a very interesting unique plane and the Americans had high hopes for it. Sadly, it didn't work out the way they wanted. Number 2. The Vought V-173, aka the Flying Pancake. Its unusually shaped design allowed it to do almost near vertical and horizontal takeoffs. It had an extremely low stall speed, which was less than around 40 knots, in its 131 hours of testing of the single prototype that exists. It was said by pilots to have unusual flight characteristics, but proved remarkably safe. I myself, I'm actually not quite sure why this plane idea didn't take off. <laughs> no pun intended. I would actually like for you guys to tell me in the comments below because I wasn't able to find a source telling me why there wasn't considered more mass production for the plane. I understand there were complications with the gearbox. Someone can tell me in the comments below why this plane actually didn't take off, no pun intended. I'd be fairly interested because they only built one of these and another similar one of a revised version of this plane. Number 1. Remember, this list is in no particular order, all these planes are equal to each other in equal weirdness. I just made the list because it sounds nice saying top five. Anyway, number one, Stimper Kaplu... Oh, I can't say this. Stimper Kaplunomori. No, I'm making up words now. Stimper Kaplun? I don't know. Whatever it is, it's nicknamed the Flying Barrel. Actually, I don't know. Definitely when it said the Flying Pancake, it was nicknamed the Flying Pancake. This one, I'm just nicknaming it for you. The Flying Barrel, as it looks, is literally a giant barrel with two sets of twin propellers inside it. One spinning clockwise, the other one spinning anti-clockwise. They only built one of these planes though. It was meant more to showcase the idea of technology possible. And it is said that this plane led to advances in jet technology. This plane also had exactly zero armaments, with the only armament being the pilot shaking his angry fist at you, shouting insults. You know, cause he's Italian. But it did work and it did fly. The weird design of it though allowed it to do very slow landings at around 42 miles per hour and its top speed is pretty low as well at 81 miles per hour. There was no real reason to advance this plane or take it into further development as it currently didn't really outperform any other planes at its current time and era. So there you have it, that's my top 5 list. But wait, there's more, there's a bonus one. And that bonus one is, da 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 da, a flying tank! Yes, the Antonov A-40. The Soviets wanted a way to take tanks from A to B faster, they experimented with getting light T-27 tanks and trying to strap them underneath the TB-3. The idea would be is that the TB-3 would fly fairly close to the ground and as slow as possible and drop off the tank from underneath it. The tanks would have to be neutral with no crew on board and the tanks theoretically would be able to take the force from the drop and would easily roll to a stop. The crew would then be dropped off by parachute later, although conveniently in war this isn't really too useful unless the enemy don't know you're there. It also had to be a very long, straight, nice flat field. It, it didn't really prove combat viable. So they experimented a new type of thing, and this is the A-40. They decided they'll get a T-60 tank, another light tank, strap a glider system to it, teach a pilot how to drive a tank, and they would tow this tank behind uh, another plane such as the TB-3 or the P-8. They only did one actual experiment with this plane, but it did fly. The one experiment they did do was with the TB-3, 
they towed this plane up, but unfortunately shortly after takeoff, the TB3 was having trouble staying in the air, so they had to lose the extra weight, which is the massive thing they're dragging behind it. So they had to release the tow cable. The A40 did its exact job. It glided down and landed fairly safely. And the pilot was actually surprised that it glided a bit more better than he thought he would for it being a flying tank. The deployment of the A40 proved to not be very combat viable, or should I say, a little bit too more expensive than it was worth. The extra wings and the tail were expensive to build. Those resources could have been invested on other things. The bombers that actually towed the planes could have been more useful dropping actual bombs. And having a trained pilot learn how to drive a tank was a waste of a skill when a pilot takes a much more effort to learn than to become an actual tank driver. So in the end, the project was scrapped. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like and consider subscribing if you want. This is generally not my usual kind of content, but consider subscribing anyway. If you didn't like this video, you know what to do anyway. Anyway, take care and I'll see you in the next one. Like, comment and subscribe or I'll break your f***ing legs.